welcome back to the Scarlet Faithful podcast. It's snowy Tuesday for some people and always happy to have Jerry Carino here to talk Rutgers basketball and no better time this season so far than now Rutgers riding a three game winning streak. Jerry, thanks so much for being here. Aaron, I have a motto and you've heard it before. It's a long season with a lot of twists and turns, but I got to tell you, didn't see this one coming. I don't know that anybody did. I don't know that Steve Peichel did, but look, this is why college basketball is great, right? Like 10 days ago, Rutgers was dead in the water. And now they have a, a – not only do they have life, they have a real pep in their step. So you never know what's around the corner in this amazing sport. Absolutely. And that was going to be my first question was, you know, with all the years you're covering New Jersey college basketball, uh, I, I mean, this has to be up there in terms of an unexpected turn. Uh, and, and I guess my follow-up to that is, how much do you think that they can maintain this uh, this positive momentum now that we're down a, the home stretch of the season? Well, I don't remember. I cannot remember in 21 years on the beat a team adding two players in February. You know, <laughs> any, even one player the, it, with the impact that Jeremiah Williams has had in February. Sometimes guys come on like at the end of the first semester. You know, you have guys come in who are injured in January sometimes, but in February, no. This is a new one. Uh, totally different dynamic. And so one of the reasons why Rutgers has been successful is because the opposing coaches had no idea what was coming. There was no film on Jeremiah Williams. So like no one knew what type of player he was, what he could do within the framework of Rutgers system. He was a total mystery. And I think it really caught the coaches by surprise. So now the question, the number one question becomes, the coaches go to school on what he's done. And so let's go back two years to the great Paul Mulcahy breakout, right? Which also took place in like late January, early February of the 2022 season when that team got off the mat after that, you know, horrendous non-conference performance reeled off a bunch of quad one wins and, you know, forced their way into the NCAA tournament because Paul Mulcahy had this tremendous run of like five or six games where he was just unstoppable and then what happened was, you know, coaches go to school on this sort of thing and figure out what can we do to limit this guy once you have some some tape, some once you have some something to work with. Uh, and that now we're going to see what the, if that's the case. Does Chris Collins or the subsequent Big Ten coaches, some of whom were very good, do they now have enough tape to better defend Jeremiah Williams? I think that's a really – Good question. That's one end of the court. And I think that's the end of the court that's going to determine whether Rutgers continues to be red hot or not. On the other end, I don't know that a coach is going to be able to do much about the defense they're facing right now. Jeremiah Williams is probably the fourth best defender on Rutgers team right now. And he's a good defender. But Steve Peichel now has five guys on the floor. His five best defensive players in his starting lineup for the first time. And Rutgers defense is going to continue to be good no matter what anybody sees on film. So to me, it's about can someone, is another coach going to sort of figure him out on the offensive end? I don't know. We'll see. Certainly they're a lot better than they were 10 days ago. Yeah, those are some great points. I love the uh, Mulcahy comparison. One thing I think that's interesting with Jeremiah is that it's not like he's, you know, been on fire shooting the basketball. He's shooting 42%, um, you know, inside to – which is well below his career average. He obviously has a lot of rust he's wearing off. And I think the big difference with him is his ability to get downhill and just beat right. his man off the dribble. So his unselfishness has is, is been huge, I think, and just uh, you know it, the spacing and the way everybody fits together now. Um, but is it a matter of um, just everyone else kind of you know filling in the roles even more so if they try to take him away moving forward? Defensively, how much have you seen out of the backcourt aside from Jeremiah, that gives you hope that, you know, this defense is for real. Yeah, they're, the defense is definitely for real. I mean, there's no question about it. They were pretty good defense before he came on. What happens now is Steve, I think he's going to stay with this lineup. He has his five best defenders in the starting lineup, right? Five really good defenders. So you you had you already had an elite defender in Mawat Mag who's finally coming around, right? It took him a while probably to get his legs under him. Uh, it seemed like he was banged up for a while, even after he returned. So now he looks like the old Mawat Mag. Now you have Cliff Amori, who's playing elite, doing elite-level rim protection. 
which he hadn't always done this season, right? And Cliff's, Cliff's always been a good shot blocker, but he hasn't always been in the in the greatest position as a defender in his career here. So he's doing that now. That's two elite defenders. And you have a third, I see a third elite defender in the making in Derek Simpson. Simpson has now become a really disruptive player. He's learned to use that, that burst that he has as a weapon on the defensive end. So now you have a very disruptive defender in the passing lanes in Simpson. Look at the deflections and the steals he had out of the gate against Wisconsin. Completely turned that game downhill for Rutgers in those first couple minutes with the way he disrupted their offense. Now you have a third really good defender. Jermichael Davis is an outstanding on-the-ball defender. He's a really important part of Rutgers' full-court press. Off the ball, he has a lot to learn still, as all freshmen do, but still he's bringing a lot as an on-the-ball defender. So now you add Jeremiah Williams, who seems to be a plus defender, right, tough physical guy who knows how to play and keep his man in front of him. That's a very hard defense to solve. To me, what Rutgers does really well is they keep guys out of the lane. It's very hard to drive against Rutgers. It's very hard to feed the post against Rutgers. The, the way to beat Rutgers defensively is to shoot threes, right? And that's hard. I mean, that's not not a lot of teams can do that. And so uh, they're really, really good defensively. I don't think that's going to change. I think this is – I don't know if it's Steve's best defense. He's had some really good ones, but it's really close. Uh, one thing that I think has been a huge boon for this team, uh, not only in how this person's handled it, but just having the depth now. Andre Hyatt, uh, now your sixth man, uh, just in terms – in terms of what he gives them both defensively and uh, in terms of shooting threes, but also just his attitude and how he's handled it, um, I feel like has been a big part of this uh, revival. Yeah, because that can be really disruptive, how right? You have, the, you have the guy with the most experience on the team, a guy who's the leading scorer who has to go to the bench. You know, he has to come off the bench as a sub, and that's hard. That's a hard thing for a coach to do. That's a hard thing to get buy-in on. Uh, just, we haven't, we haven't talked to Andre since he, since his role changed. So I couldn't tell you what's in his head, but the, the, what you're seeing on the court from him seems like buy-in. He's played really well for him in this role. And also Steve has played him late in these games, right? He's a good free throw shooter, which matters. He's got a lot of experience. So it's not like he's just coming in as like a sub who's going to play five minutes in the body of the game. He's been on the court in crunch time and He's done a really good job boxing out and rebounding too. So look, Hyatt is, he's a guy who can add scoring punch, uh, but he's also rebounding well and he's a good hustle player. So he's really an ideal six man for them right now. He can play like two or three different positions, the two and the three. He can maybe guard fours in a pinch. And so that's a nice piece to have, but he's got to accept that. So it's a good sign of a team first guy. Like, I think Rutgers' culture is really good. Their locker room is really good, Aaron. And so I don't know if that was really the case last year. Like you and I have talked about this. It seemed like mm -hmm. there was a lot of angst going on at the end of last season. Uh, I don't I don't think that's the case here. It helps to have a good locker room, and that's a good example. So now you have a sixth guy who knows knows his role, and then you bring in a a, uh, a Fernandez, who Noah Fernandez, who to everybody's credit, they kept in the rotation, right, because he's a guy who knows how to play basketball makes his free throws, can handle the ball. So now you have him coming off the bench knowing his role. Remember, he came here to be the starting point guard. He's now coming in as like a seventh man type of role. And he's been playing, I thought, fairly well in all respects other than shooting. And then you saw like all the shooting came together when he absolutely torched Wisconsin. And good for him. He's a great dude. You you know this. He's a great guy. And it's been it's been hard for him, man. He's He's got a newborn, you know, he's got a one-year-old. Yeah, you and I know, and you're closer to that age with your kids than I am now. That's hard. Like, and we have had, I, I can speak for myself, like there have been days on the job when I my performance has sucked because my kids have worn me out. And so his job with, with Noah, it's much more public. And so he's dealing with that. And you have to consider that there's battles going on off the court in people's lives that maybe might be impacting them. So Good for him. So now you have seven guys. And then you have Emmanuel Ogboli, this, this sort of ox, this humongous guy to come in and spell Cliff and hold the fort and rebound and set screens, which he's pretty good at, it looks like. Now you have eight guys. 
So now you have an eight-man rotation where everybody knows their role, everybody embraces their role, everybody can do their thing, and this is when you have a good team, right? This is now the makings of the rotation that Peichel has been looking for for months. Yeah, I think that's a huge part of it is that I, I, I've been saying all season, I, I think the attitudes have been really positive, but it was almost like people, everybody was trying to do too much on their own, uh, forcing things uh, before Jeremiah Williams, and now everybody just fits better together. Uh, w- one thing I think you touched on that that I think is relevant is, you know, this team really has faced a ton of adversity already this season. Um, and it feels like they're turning that into positive mojo. How much does it remind you of that group from two years ago that, you know, obviously some of it was self-inflicted, but this group seems like it, it hasn't been self-inflicted per se. It's just been circumstances and, you know, coming off all, all the injuries with so many players, uh, you know, that had to be a disjointed off season a little bit and preseason. Um, how, how surprised, I guess, are you just aside from everything else? that they've been able to overcome that and still have have the chance they have now. Well, like, for example, Derek Simpson, right? Like, he, he was supposed to be a complimentary player this year. But then the two guys leave, you know, leave late in the cycle, transfer out. And then you have uh, – they bring in Austin Williams, who's had a lot of knee problems, right? He never can get quite get past his knee injury. They were counting on him. But he hasn't been able to go a lot of the time. And so it's hard, man. He, he really sacrificed his knee for Hartford. Like people don't realize, I don't even think, I don't think Hartford had a trainer. I think if you go back and look, they had no trainer. Like they, they were totally scaling down their program. Oh, Austin man. Williams, Austin Williams busts up his knee, plays, continues to play to help Hartford reach the NCAA tournament. So like he's playing on one leg basically. So you have that. And again, they bring him in because, you know, they had nobody when those two guys left in May and June, late May and, and early June. And so you have that situation going on. Uh, you had Mawat coming off an injury. You had Ogboli who was hurt. So you had an unusual amount of guys coming, going, ineligible, unable to play, unable to practice. And a lot of the burden fell on Derek Simpson, who was supposed to be a complimentary player, who is definitely Der- – Derek Simpson is a winning player in the Big Ten. Is he? Is he going to lead – is he going to be the point guard – Running an offense that makes the NCAA tournament as a sophomore, no, that's probably that was probably too big of a leap for him this year. But he's a winning complimentary player. And now you see him in the complimentary role. And he's playing a lot of minutes. But now you see him in the complimentary role alongside Jeremiah Williams. And you see how much better he is, how much less you have to rely on his scoring and allow him to do the other things that he does so well uh, and the speed that can really disrupt another team. Now you see how that works. So yeah, there's been some, there's been a lot of adversity. There's been a lot of hurdles. Uh, I got to give Steve credit. He's very even keeled guy. You know, there were times when I thought he would lose it. I mean, after that, that debacle against Penn state, I probably would have lost it if I was him, right? That was a really embarrassing thing in front of a sold out or close to it home arena. They had some real low points. Um, you know, they beat Stonehill by one. And by the way, People laughed and mocked when we said Derek Simpson's shot saved the season. Well, you know what? If you have that quad four win hanging around your neck like a millstone right now, you can't go anywhere. And so that was a huge thing in retrospect. But even then, like Steve has reserved the fire and brimstone. And he, you know, he's been really confident with the and upbeat with these guys behind the scenes. A guy like Noah Fernandez, you saw what his quotes were, right? After the the uh, Wisconsin game, he said, I've never been around people this positive. Their positivity. They've lifted me up uh, and because the people believed in me, that's why I'm able to come back like this. And so that that's a tone that that starts at the top with the head coach. So everybody from top to bottom deserves a lot of credit. The culture is really good in Rutgers basketball. The attitudes are really good. Uh, and when you can just add a little bit of firepower to what already is a good culture, you see what a difference it can make, especially in a league where, as we've talked about, there's not a whole ton of difference between most of these teams in the middle of the pack. Yeah, those are some great points. And uh, it definitely was uh, seemed like a trouble zone after the Penn State game. You know, would things really start to unravel there? And obviously, the exact opposite has happened. You had uh, Jeremiah Williams on uh, Jersey Jump Shot, your podcast today, uh, or on Monday. Uh, and he actually mentioned that there was a possibility they thought he was going to be able to make his debut against Penn State on that Wednesday night. Um, 
you know, how much do you think that that took a toll, not only in that game specifically, but just the fact that he was able to practice with the team, which is obviously benefiting him now, but knowing what a key piece he was uh, and not being able to have him in games, I, I think that might be an angle where just this team really was kind of a, uh, on their a weight on their shoulders a little bit, not having a player like that at their disposal. Well, for starters, they never expected him to be part of the part of the team this year on the court. He was brought in. I mean, he had two things going against him, and no one in their right mind, nobody could have predicted that the transfer sit out was going to fall apart mid season. I mean, maybe at the end of the season. But the idea that the sit-out veil was just lifted in the middle of the season, no one could have predicted that. So the expectations were that he was going to sit out this year. They brought him in as a practice player and to get to get him ready for next year. Because as we've talked about before, Aaron, you need men in college basketball. You, you cannot – Rutgers, as good as the t- recruits they have coming in are, the Fab Five days are over. You can't have 18-year-old boys – lead you deep into March. They can be your star players, but you need men on the court with them. And so next year is the last year of the fifth year COVID guys. You're going to have 23, 24 and 25 year old men throughout college basketball. Jeremiah Williams is a man. They, you need him in the mix with these young guys they're bringing in. And so that was kind of, I think the idea behind bringing him in, which was smoke uh, smokes job, by the way, he was, his guy who he found through the portal, I'm sure he knew somebody from the Chicago area who knew Jeremiah, that he'd be a good fit. Uh, but they never thought he was going to be part of this until sometime in December, I think mid-December, when the whole sit-out thing falls apart under the weight of a court order. And now the possibility he could play becomes apparent, right? And it's obvious at that time that Rutgers does need him, in fact. Mm -hmm. Uh, And then it became like a sort of a six-week waiting game, uh, waiting for the NCA to rule on his his gambling suspension. So I do think once you got to that point, there was a lot of uncertainty over, like, we're going to be able to use this guy. He's a good player in practice. And so that obviously was a little bit of a cloud hanging over things. And Steve kept saying, we're going to be adding a new guy soon. We're going to be adding him. And then they kept not adding him because, you know, they hadn't have a ruling from the NCA. So as soon as they got a ruling from the NCA, then they were able to go to the judge and get the order. But they had to wait for the ruling, which I guess came down, you know, right before that Penn State game. Then you got to get your you got to get your legal brief in before the judge, and so that I guess took some time. You know, you got to you got to get a you have to get a hearing a hearing date. So. That was, I think, the maneuvering that they didn't know if it was going to happen before or after. So, but it happened sooner than they they got him eligible sooner than they thought. But yes, that was another thing hovering over this team. So there's been an unusual amount of unsettled, an unsettled, uh, unsettled um, business surrounding the program this year, which is why you got a lot of really scattershot play. And now it's settled, and you're seeing a team that's. Better like we thought it would be. Even we didn't think Williams would play, but we thought this would be like a, a postseason team, right? We all thought that, and maybe not NCA or maybe bubble type team, maybe NIT. We all thought this team would play in the postseason back in October, and now you're seeing once things are settled what the group is capable of. Yeah, it's like they all were able to take breaths now and clear their heads, and uh, you just see the positive play on the court. Uh, another player that's been through a lot of adversity, uh, just in terms of you know all the hype. Coming in, Gavin Griffiths, they have stuck with him quite a bit. You know, he has uh, been, even with Jeremiah back, he's playing 15 to 20 minutes a game. Uh, and and I think he has made some strides and he's shown some flashes here and there. What are your thoughts on Gavin Griffiths and, and where he fits in moving forward the rest of the season? Well, they're doing the right thing by playing him. I mean, you have to play him, right? He's got to get some experience. He needs a role. He's in the rotation and he should be in the rotation because – you know, you have to, this potential there. There's an offensive potential that a program like Rutgers, which is defense based, needs. Griff is a shot maker. He's a guy with offensive, good offensive intuition. And so that needs to be unlocked. Uh, and this is the time to get some of that now, get him in the mix now. But to me, like now, he may yet, I don't, I don't want to say have like a Noah Fernandez type game, although he did burn Seton Hall pretty badly. He may yet hit a couple big shots this season. 
So the, they're not just playing him on the court as a the purely developmental case. He does have the ability to get hot and make shots and keep a defense honest. But the real, the re, to me, it's the long view with him. And can you, can you get him up to speed for next year to be a real contributor next year? And also, look, he's going to have to get in the weight room over the summer. He's got to get bigger. That's part of being in a college program of Rutgers stature. Uh, they're going to have to beef him up so he can defend better. Uh, right now, they're, you know, they're living with his, his challenges defensively, which most freshmen have. He does have to get stronger. So you do see you do see potential there. Uh, he hasn't had the role. He has had less of a role than I think any of us envisioned back in October. But you know, like we said, you when you're an 18 year old playing with men, it's a difficult adjustment. And so he's got more of a learning curve ahead. They're doing the right thing playing him. He could yet help them this year, but to me, his his time in the court this year right now is about next year. Yeah, for sure. And uh, one thing I focused on in my podcast on Monday, which I, I think is an interesting dynamic now with the rotation, is your three best potential three-point shooters, Andre Hyatt, Noah Fernandes, and Gavin Griffiths, are all coming off the bench now. So I think it's really fascinating because uh, in the Big Ten play, you know, they are facing teams that that aren't particularly good uh, in defending the three. And I know, obviously, getting to the rim and uh, getting downhill with the, the personnel they have has been a priority. But I do think for them to, to reach their ceiling as a team, whatever that may be, uh, I think they need to get some type of consistent production from behind the arc. So I'm, I'm fascinated to see how Pykel works it, uh, especially in the second half of games, similar to how you saw Noah break out against Wisconsin. I guess what are your thoughts and just down the stretch here now and, and even how the whole Big Ten is kind of shaken out? Well, first of all, you're right. I mean, of course, that's why they never – that's why they always kept playing Fernandez, right? That's why they kept him in the rotation. People, you know, and we know who the people are. People are screaming, you know, bench this guy, anchor him to the bench, cut him, run him out of town. I mean, come on. The guy was a really good player at UMass. He shot over 40% from three-point range at UMass. So he didn't just forget how to shoot. He's slumping, had some issues, right? But you you got to keep a guy like that engaged. You need the shooting. And so if he's reawakened, that's big. Steve is putting his best defenders on the court, but he's also putting guys who can get downhill. Like you used the phrase downhill, right? And from the beginning of the season, the philosophy was they're going to play faster, and they have played faster. You look at the scores, all right, so they're in the 50s against Maryland. They're in the 60s. But they are – their tempo is up. It's faster this year. Mm -hmm. And they're, they're using this full-court pressure – that totally melted Wisconsin on uh, Saturday. They're using full court pressure more and more effectively than they ever have in Steve's eight years. So they are speeding these games up. They really, I mean, Wisconsin plays at a snail's pace. They really sped Wisconsin up and took them out of their comfort zone. And that's because you have guys getting downhill on offense and then like forcing the issue on defense. So Steve is, is going with those guys to start and then bringing in the firepower from beyond the arc off the bench. You know, it's it's an interesting tactic, seems to be working. But I, I do agree with you, regardless of, like, who's starting, who's subbing in, who's getting how many minutes, Rutgers has to – you cannot – you're only going to go so far without hitting three-pointers. This is the game now. You have to hit some threes, and that's what Penn State did when they came here, right? So you have to hit some threes. So, like, you're right. They have to get some production out of those guys, which is why you don't, you don't give up on them. You keep – you keep a guy like Gavin Griffiths and Noah Fernandez engaged because they get hot and they could win you a game. Yeah. Uh, I, I think that's what's so interesting about this dynamic now and how different it is, but I always enjoy benches that, you know, give you that potential for scoring punch right away. Uh, and I think, you know, the, the benches, those three guys are going to win them a game down the road. They Well, look at, look at Seton Hall, Aaron. Seton Hall has no bench. They have one guy. And the, that's, it's a major difference when you get into February when everybody's tired, teams are banged up, you know, flu season, the whole bit. Like, you need you need that that depth. You don't need 10 guys necessarily. 10's a lot. 10's like the max. Steve likes to play 10. He appears to be at 9 at the moment. Uh, but you need a solid 8. Like, Seton Hall has 6, and I think that's one reason why they've hit a wall. So that, that depth is helping. Rutgers, you asked me about the league, the Big Ten. I didn't really answer your question. Uh, so there's a lot of parity in the middle here, right? There's not a lot of difference between these teams. Obviously, Purdue is an elite team, a national title contender. 
as long as they don't play FDU, right? Uh, as or St. Peter's, as long as they don't get a Jersey mid-major. Uh, right. Purdue's really, really good. And then, you know, you and I both think Illinois, the upside for them is super high because they have a they have an All-American player. They have dudes, right? They have big, big players, size, length, athleticism, a lot of firepower. So, like, Illinois has the makings of being an elite team. I do – I do think Michigan State will be a, will be a headache, a tough out in March. Uh, I think they're getting it together just in time. I know they're on the bubble. I guess technically they're not going to be on a bubble. They're going to be in the tournament field, and they're going to probably give some people fits. So I do think Michigan State. I would say beyond those three teams, you know, there's really a, there's there's not much difference between Rutgers and the rest of these teams, mm-hmm. and so that's a bonus. Now the league is down. They're not going to get a lot of teams in the NCAA tournament this year. They're not getting nine teams in, eight teams in. They're down, but there's a lot of ability for Rutgers to move up and win games here because they're very comparable now and their present state to most of these other teams. And so, you know, it's a, it's a good spot to be in. Like, they're still chasing. They're still hunting, right? They're still chasing down the pack, but you could, it's conceivable that they could, they could reel off a bunch of wins here because of the parity in the league. And uh, a couple more for you, just in terms of the perception of this season, of this program. Uh, of course, next season, high expectations before we're even into the offseason. But how do you think, it, how important has it been for this team and this program to get off the mat the way they have, regardless of what happens now down the stretch? Uh, the, the fact that they've uh, bringing respectability back and uh, potentially finishing strong. How important do you think that is just for momentum heading into the off season of what will be a wild and uh, extremely critical year in the Steve Peichel era? It's a great question. It's really interesting, Aaron. I love that question. I love that you use the phrase off the mat, right? That's a Peichel phrase. And it's really, it's kind of been one of the things his teams have done over and over again in his eight years here, especially the last five years or so. Uh, Part of me wants to say that it means nothing because there's going to be an immense amount of turnover throughout college basketball. There's going to be turnover at Rutgers. You're not bringing all the guys back who are able to come back. And you're not bringing all the guys you want to come back back. It's just not going to happen. It's just not the way it works. I can't tell you this guy's going to leave, this guy's going to leave. I don't know the answer to that. But I do know, and we should know this by now, after last year and the year before, that guys are going to walk out the door Move on. It's just the nature of the game now. So, um, so part of me wants to say, I think part of half of it is, it's just every year you're just hitting the reset button, right? And so, there's a new team next year, and it's going to be new vibes. Obviously, you'll have the same head coach. Um, but, but the what I'll say to that is, there will be guys who are part of this core, this this off the mat group that I know, Steve. Here's, here's what I can tell you. Having talked, I talk to Steve a lot. Uh, sometimes, you know, I interview him and sometimes we just talk. And he really likes this group. This group is like the, he uses the term blue collar, right? Like this is a group that has, no one has, has handed these guys anything. No one's told these guys how great they are. All, this, is a, this is mostly a team of up from the bootstraps type of guys. And so I do think he's really enjoying coaching them. Um, and is there a something you can burn into your DNA from having gotten off the mat, taking the body blows, showing you have an iron jaw? Is there something you can draw on from deep down if you are a guy who stays and is part of next year's team? You know, if you're a Jermichael Davis, um, if you're uh, a Derek Simpson, a Gavin Griffiths, you know, one of the younger generation guys – who is back next year and part of the mix, is there something you can draw from, whether it's personal or as a team or as a team leader, from this experience that will help you in the inevitable tough spot that will come next year? Because they're not going 30 and 0 next year. You know, you're <laughs> gonna have they're gonna have a losing streak next year. I mean, this yep. is what happens. It's what happens. You're in the Big Ten. This is high major college basketball. It's college basketball, period. Is there something these guys can look back on and say, we got off the mat with this group. We can do it now with more talent. That's, I think, where I don't know. Maybe there will be. And so that's where like the lessons of this year, the muscle memory or that that 
tenacity that is a developed trait sometimes from having been knocked down, like that's where that maybe can come in handy next year. So I do believe in that. I'm a big believer in that, like that's something you can carry with you, even though there is going to be a lot of turnover in, in every college basketball program. So I kind of I kind of gave you the both sides answer, but <laughs> I, I tend to believe that that there will be something that there will be something that a belief that carries over from this, even though the reset button largely gets pushed, if that makes sense. Yeah, absolutely. It actually taps into kind of my, my, the most fascinating thing I think about going into next year, uh, in which we're seeing again now is that this program has never been at its best. or is always at its best, excuse me, always at its best with its back against the wall. And that is not the mentality or the kind of perception that you're going to have with next year's team. And how does Steve Peichel react to that? How does he handle that? How does he lead with that? I think that's a, a huge question that we have plenty of time in the offseason to get into. But that being said, uh, their back is against the wall once again. Uh, ultimately, uh, last question for you. Uh, how, what do you think is going to happen? How do you think this team is going to finish out 2024 season? Well, I think they'll finish well. I mean, I, I expect them to be in the postseason. I think they've, I think they've gotten over the hurdle. Now they have to win a bunch of games, okay? But I, I think I believe this team will make it into the postseason. I will be very surprised if they finish under five hundred and get blanked. Uh, I, I don't see that. I think they've turned the corner. I don't see them relapsing back to what they were. I do, like I indicated after in your first in the first question, you are going to see these very good Big Ten coaches going to school on Jeremiah Williams, how he plays with Cliff, how can they disrupt that, his attacking the rim. Uh, I think you'll see some, you know, some some uh, chess moves against that, right, the counter moves. And so I, I saw Brad Wachtel said, you know, he, he thinks they need to go 7-1 and one to make the NCAA tournament. That's a lot to ask. That's a lot to ask. We have a game at Purdue, you know, so that's a very difficult game. Uh, I don't know about the NCAA tournament, but you know, it's anything's possible for sure. Um, but I do think this team's going to play in the postseason. And could I see them winning, you know, two thirds of their remaining games? Well, yeah. By the way they're playing, yeah. With the opponents they have, yes. Yes. They do have some tough road trips coming. They're not going to just walk into Wisconsin and win by 22 points. Okay. <laughs> they're not going to, you know, we, we already talked about Purdue. Very tough game. They have a, a, a tough game, a road game at Minnesota Sunday night. That's yep. a tough road game. Minnesota is now very good in that barn. And so yep. there are, they're going to be tested. Um, and, you know, some of these, a lot of these games, Aaron, come down to a handful of possessions and a, and a bounce of the ball. And so we'll see. But I think you've mentioned this a couple of times over the last couple of weeks. Rutgers is kind of due for a break, right? Mm -hmm. They had some really bad luck the last few years. Last year with Mawat Mag, you can run down the list of things that have happened in years past um, that have been bad bounces and bad breaks, and they're due for one. And they're getting one now that they have their full team and they're healthy at a time when opponents are worn down. They have a new like sort of knuckleball to throw at teams with a new look offense. So I do see Rutgers playing in the postseason. I see them winning some more big games. Uh, I see them being a real tough out and a thorn in everybody's side. I think we're going to see this team have, by the time all is said and done, like what I bet my mortgage that they're going to be in the NCAA tournament, I would not do that. But by the time all is said and done, I, I do think the, the, the Rutgers fan will have a positive uh, impression of this year's, tra the transition year that this team is, is going to be able to put together. Yeah, I agree with you. And uh, John Templin, uh, NY Buckets, who I know you uh, follow as well, the, uh, the preeminent NIT bracketology. Yes. <laughs> what a world! NIT bracketology! He put yeah, he's, good. In he's very good at it. Yeah, he is. He's very good. And he put Rutgers in the field as of tonight. Uh, and obviously the new NIT rules is going to be high major heavy. Uh, yes. So, yeah, but what, you know, basically said if Rutgers has is 17 and 14, he thinks they're in. And uh, they're only four wins away from that. And uh, it's uh, to end, it's pretty crazy because looking back at when Mawat Mag's injury happened, it was exactly a year to the date. Uh, the last day of that one-year period was the Michigan game when things started yeah. to turn around for Rutgers. So yep. who knows? It might have been a year of bad luck, and maybe things are starting to turn in a really positive way. 
I'm just glad that I had a good excuse to get you back on the pod and something fun to talk. I didn't want to bring you on for a funeral in January. So thank you so yeah. much for all your time and insight once again. Hey. And uh, hey, hopefully we can uh, link up before the postseason. You know what, Aaron? As you know, it's fun when the team's playing well. Fans are engaged. It's good for business for us. And look, this is you, you cover sports because you want you want excitement, right? You don't want to see a team getting its head kicked in. And Rutgers is now providing the excitement. So if this continues, please have me back on in March. We'd love to spend some more time with you chopping it up. There's no better fan coverage of Rutgers sports, but especially Rutgers basketball than Aaron Brightman and the Scarlet Faithful. And I'm always happy to be your guest. Thank you, Jerry. I'm going to cut that a million times and put that all over social media. Uh, I always appreciate it. And uh, thanks so much. And uh, thanks for watching once again. And uh, we'll talk to you soon. All right. <laughs>